I was trying to think back <clears throat> other times. I know I've preached on this topic about the church and uh, uh, church attendance. That's going to be what we're talking about tonight. And all I could find is twice that I preached about it in, in Iola, and it was Sunday school classes both times. And then otherwise, I think it's just come up in different times, but it feels like it's something that comes up a lot. You say, well, why are you always talking about church uh, membership? Well, it's a hobby horse. <laughs> so here we go. Old Baptist hobby horses. Uh, something that I grew up, church attendance is something that's always preached on. Uh, in fact, probably more than anything, it was just like, you got to come to church, you got to come to church, you got to come to church. And quite honestly, when it comes to discipleship after salvation, hey, what do I do? How come my life keeps falling apart? Well, come to church, you know. What do I have to do, you know, the, uh, uh, to grow? I don't understand the Bible. Well, come to church and hear the preaching. I mean, if you think about it, come to church is a solution to a lot of, uh, uh, you know, problems. And just if you just come to church, be faithful to church, you'll grow. You'll get under the preaching of the word. You'll be around other believers. You'll be encouraged and uh, all that. So, hey, it's nothing new that Baptists uh, have preached on church attendance for a long time. And uh, Wednesday night, I didn't end up live streaming or recording the, the sermon, but Wednesday in Iola, I mean, I'm sorry, last Sunday night, uh, what was it? Yeah, last Sunday night, and we talked about um, a church. Uh, the idea was, is church public or is it private? And I got some different reasons for thinking about that and wanting to uh, study that out and, and explain that a little bit better. And so I, I began to look at that, and some people were interested in that topic. I'm not really going to address that much today. I was thinking that I might, but it might come up a little bit uh, about what I talked about. But the uh, idea here, church attendance, obviously we're going to have to define this and all that. So we're going to try to do this uh, a, a lot, cover a lot here in this sermon as much as I can on this, on this topic. But church attendance. Uh, Hebrews 10, obviously, that's where we read 10.25 is the most common verse that's often quoted. You know, forsake not the assembly. Really, that's probably the only place where you can just flat out say the Bible says we're supposed to go to church. And if somebody says, well, I just don't think you got to go to church. I think you could just stay home. And you, Hebrews 10.25, I mean, this is, a, this is common teaching. Okay, and this is perfect timing for this sermon because, quite honestly, we're right now at record low attendance. So particularly in Iola, last two Sundays. Now, a lot of people sick, various reasons, a lot of things going on. Uh, in fact, let me just list a few few reasons I think attendance is down so low. First of all, yes, there's something with the whole COVID thing and people quarantining. And, and uh, I don't know for sure how many people that are staying home. It's just because of that. But obviously, that's what's going on. That's kind of the climate of our society. How many times you're knocking on doors? Hey, do you go to church anywhere? Well, not since COVID. I'm like, that's a long time not to go to church. Almost a year now, <laughs> it seems like. And, and uh, not to go to church. And they say since COVID, they just haven't been going to church. Or another thing is live stream. You know, a lot of people say, well, I just do live stream now. Well, from the very beginning, this is what a lot of preachers were saying. The problem with live stream is going to become too comfortable to just stay home and watch it online. And be like, well, I'm doing this for my family. I'm protecting everybody. I'm doing this for the church. I don't want to make anybody sick. Much easier just sit at home in your recliner and watch, uh, watch the service online. That's not the same. That's not assembling. There's something that's definitely missed when people, spirit-filled people, get together and the Lord's actually in the midst of us and we're actually encouraging each other in a physical body and seeing each other. Uh, you know, this is, uh, this is important. And this is why I travel with my family uh, down here to, uh, twice a week to uh, be with you guys physically. Now we could put a big screen up here and just you guys just come at your will and if you want to watch it here and assemble together you could watch me preaching on Wednesday nights and Sundays in Iola. If you're going to do that I would, get, I, would, I would ask you to just consider getting a different preacher that's better than me or okay, if you're just going to sit here and watch preaching. But there's something different when your pastor's actually here and you're talking with them and you can ask them questions. And after the service, you can sit down and talk about some things, okay? And not just the pastor, but you need that with each other. And you, in fact, there's ways that you guys can fellowship with each other, encourage each other that your pastor can't do. And so, uh, so it's very important. But here's what happens. You got COVID right now. You got the, the comfort of live stream. You've got right now, I know of a couple cases where people are just kind of backsliding, living in sin. 
And look, it happens. We've all got our ups and downs, and it's really easy to just be like, you know what? I'm just kind of, you know, after you don't come for a couple times and your life starts falling back a little bit, you're just like, you know what? It's just, I better just stay away. You know what I mean? And look, there's, there, there's some cases where if you're not going to get something right, well, you do need to stay away until you get that right. But, uh, uh, but when somebody's willing to repent and say, hey, I'm all out for the Lord, well, we want to receive them back. We want to get them, uh, uh, you know, back under the preaching and all that. But that'll keep people out of church. Uh, the uh, Now what we've got going on with us is the cold. Okay, that's why we had record low attendance in Iola, uh, two services in a row, just hardly anybody there. My family and and uh, and one other in, in some cases, because of the fact that it's just we got a lot of older folks there. They can't get out. The weather. Who wants to go outside? <laughs> you know, it's not going to get better this weekend. And like I said, this is one heart S Sunday coming up, so I don't know what'll happen exactly. Now, I never want to push people to go, especially if it's dangerous out and, and, and it might be icy or whatever. Especially our older folks. I don't want to jeopardize them. Hey, do what's comfortable. This is what I said with the COVID thing too. The very beginning of this, hey, if you feel like being around other people is going to put you at risk, hey, you know, that's up to you. That's your decision. But at the end of the day, we are commanded to assemble together. We got to be together uh, or else we're, we're missing out on something. And so this is the kind of stuff we're preaching. I'm preaching about tonight. And it's a bit of a hobby, Baptist hobby horse, always talking about this. You got to assemble, got to assemble. Now, let me just say this, that sometimes the emphasis is so much on, hey, we got to get people in here and you better be faithful and you better tithe and you better do all that. And if we're not careful, and I've, I think I have mentioned this here several times, I'm sure, because this is something that personally I deal with is this mentality that I've been raised, I was raised with, I'm not putting anybody down. It's just what I knew being an independent Baptist church is that there was a huge push towards, hey, you got to come, you got to be faithful, you got to give your tithe. And this is the measure of success of the church, right? If it's full, if everybody's there, if everybody's tithing, man, that's a healthy church. Hey, that's a prosperous church. Well, there's a whole lot more to church than and the fact that everybody's tithing, okay? Uh, but if we're not careful, that is what the push is. That's why we want the people. That's why we're preaching against uh, 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 telling everybody that not to forsake the assembly. If we're not careful, it's self-motivated because we want the success. We don't want anybody laughing at us because we only got a handful of people. I've heard a lot of people do that in the past. I mean, how every time a uh, church gets in the media, you know, what do they want to do? Well, it's just a handful of people there in this little weird cult over there, you know? Well, who cares how many people? I don't care if it's three people. It's still a church, and we're still having church. Okay, but, uh, but sometimes if we're not careful, it's all about we got to get this place filled up. But let me just say this. I've always been taught, hey, you're supposed to just try to fill it up, do everything you can to fill the place up. And here's what I have noticed. When the place is filled up and there are a lot of people physically attending, it's exciting. It is. It's just more exciting. As the preacher now, more than ever, uh, I've noticed it with other preachers throughout my life, but now that I am the pastor and I preach on a regular basis, I found this when there's a lot of people, it's easier to preach. It just is. When there's only just a handful of people out there, it's really hard to like be exciting and to be, it's nothing against those people. It's not like, Hey, I don't, you know, it's only you guys. I, I want everybody else to come. It's not that it's just, it feels bizarre. You know what I mean? To just have a couple people and you're standing up behind a pulpit and you're, but when there's lots of people, it's like everything just changes. Maybe it's wrong. I don't know. But I find that whenever I've got a group of people, maybe you've noticed in some of our bigger services, even invitation, I mean, uh, not invitation, what's it called? Uh, announcements and stuff like that. Getting up there and giving the announcements, I'm just more, you know, making jokes and all that kind of stuff because there's a lot of people and it's exciting, okay? So so I understand that. That's, that's where, uh, this is where... Uh, you know, the performance uh, is better, not in the sense of like just, hey, we're performing, but just being able to function and do things, it just works better. Everybody does a better job. It's exciting to hear all the voices singing out and all that. Not only that, it is legitimate. It is a legitimate reason to consider that when a lot of people are there, hey, the, the Great Commission's being, it's like evidence that we're following the Great Commission, right? We're, we saw people getting saved and now... You know, hopefully they've been baptized and they're getting involved in church. They're being discipled. You feel like, hey, we're doing what we're supposed to do. Now, obviously, you're going out there. We're going out there. We're, we're seeing a lot of souls saved. Praise the Lord for that, even if they never come to church. 
But when you physically see them, it's more exciting. And you're like, yes, they're coming. You know, the baptism waters are being stirred. And you're like, yes, people are, are following the Lord. And they're growing and they're being discipled. And it feels like, yeah, you're fulfilling what you're supposed to be doing. So look, don't get me wrong and make it seem like I'm just saying, hey, well, who cares? It doesn't matter if people come or they don't come. In fact, discourage the ones that aren't like us not to come and <laughs> everything. Look, there are people like that. But no, it's exciting. And there is a reason to have bigger crowds if you can, if you can. Now, I'm probably never going to get past this mentality because it's been so ingrained in me, especially guys when they go off to Bible college, it's ingrained in you. And you're in the, when you go off to Bible college, you're in a big church because all the college kids go to the same church and you're seeing a thriving bus ministry and you're seeing all these people come in and you're seeing just, wow, all these people. And you begin to think like, when I become a pastor, that's what I've got to see happen or else I'm not being successful. You know, and they uh, are just lucrative and lots of money coming in. And if I don't do that, then I'm not successful. Well, I might never get that mentality out of my head completely. Okay, it might always be there a little bit. But I do have to keep reminding myself that that's not the focus of church. Uh, however, uh, we do per sometimes do little incentives and, and, and special services and promotions trying to get people to come, people that haven't come for a long time. Maybe people that have been saying, hey, I want to come visit you guys sometime and I want to come see what it's like and get plugged in. Hey, we got to find a way uh, to get them in, <laughs> you know, uh, compel them to come in. And and uh, sometimes we'll, hey, after service, we're going to have a dinner. Now, we, we've been doing that every night lately, but, <laughs> you know, sometimes a special thing like that. We'll get somebody to come and look, it's a it's a balance between saying, hey, we're just here to preach the gospel. I mean, not preach the gospel, preach the Bible and uh, and uh, to encourage everybody and, and, and send, uh, you know, send everybody out when they go back to, you know, to their to their lives outside of church to be preaching the gospel to everybody they meet and all that. And uh, uh, obviously that's what we want to do. But. Uh, but there's some times where you're like, what can we do to get more people in here? That's just our, our that's the way that my, my mindset has been just kind of locked in that way. And we certainly don't want to get comfortable with, uh, you know, just the handful. Hey, we're like-minded, we're friends, you know, we four, no more. Uh, you know, the, that's, a easy, that's easy to get to that way. And here's why. Because we like each other. I mean, I hope everybody in here likes each other. But we're a family. You know, we found that our family, uh, our family of six now, I was going to say five, we've kind of gotten into the groove. We know each other. We know what each other's likes, you know. And so sometimes to add somebody else from the outside in, it's difficult. Hey, we like the way that we do things. And sometimes a church can become that, just a small family, and you're just like, hey, this is the way we like things. And if somebody else comes in, I recently put on Facebook a uh, this and I didn't mean it quite this way, but this could be dangerous. But but here's what I was saying. You know, if you just be the kind of person that you like being around, you're never really bothered whenever people that aren't like you are just like, hey, you know what? I don't want to be around him. And they leave you. You're just like, it's OK, because I didn't I, I'm, I'm not happy with that kind of person anyway. I'm being the kind of person that I want to be. So you're going to attract people that are just like you that way. And so now we got a group of people. Hey, we know what we like. And we're just, you know, we share some interest and we share some likes. And it would be real easy to get to the point where we got walls up and we're like suddenly not welcoming to anybody who's not just like us. This is part of being um, a church, not just a family, but a church that says, hey, we've got to minister one to another. We've got to understand that not everybody's in the same place in their life and, in, and spiritually speaking. And so, uh, so we definitely want to uh, not, not just get this idea that, hey, we go out and preach the gospel and then, hey, we only need a handful of people in here. We enjoy each other and don't have to worry about getting other people in here. No, we, we do need to bring people in. <clears throat> so it is good to have some goals to get some people to come, especially if they haven't been here for a while. Hey, motivate them to come back in. So I was thinking about this, uh, this statement here. Promotions and special events are a great supplement to the ministry of the church. Okay, there's nothing wrong with promotions, special day, a special service to try to get people in. That's a good supplement, right? But you can't live off of supplements. Like if somebody just said, you know what, I'm just going to live off of vitamins, they'd probably die. You got to have food. <laughs> okay? 
it's a good supplement to the ministry of the church to say, hey, we want to do these programs and special events and get together for dinner or whatever, but that can't replace, you know, what the church is all about, what we're supposed to be doing. So, uh, so what some churches will start doing is they'll start seeing some growth. They'll start inviting people. They have the programs. They'll do everything they can to get people into the church. So they're seeing big attendances. And all of a sudden, their entire church ministry is based off, hey, how do we get the bus ministry and get people coming in? And still maybe seeing some souls get saved at the altars or, or you know, talking to people that come to church on the way home or whatever. I understand that. Not going to knock anybody who's getting souls saved. But a lot of times then they fail to go out and do this, the door knocking. They fail to go out and do the outreach because it's all about, hey, we got to have a, a big production and everything. So these are the kind of problems that we deal with. And the idea of church attendance, again, the point of this series is to talk about old Baptist hobby horses and not only talk about, you know, why we're supposed to be preaching on these things and what, what the issues are, but also where we've gone wrong over the years and some maybe why some people kind of got away from preaching on these things because they recognized some things were wrong. But look, there's still some, uh, uh, some areas we need to preach on. So let me talk about four different way, four different uh, things about the church. I was able to make them all start with E, okay? <laughs> so four things about the church based on our text here in Hebrews chapter 10. First of all, look at 25. Here's the big verse, the popular verse. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Now, in a nutshell, I, I, I do want to preach, preach uh, expositorily through the book of Hebrews sometimes. I'm not sure when or where or, or how I'm going to do it exactly, but I would like to do that. But if you think about it, I, I believe that the whole, the whole purpose and the mindset of Hebrews is to say, you know, we are saved now. You know, we're not saved by works. We're not saved by the law, whatever. We're saved by grace. But now we have to do those things that accompany salvation. We need to, we need to move on and do those things. We need to do the works. We need to do, uh, you know, provoke one another to good, to good works. We need to uh, do the work of the ministry. We need to not forsake the assembling of ourselves together. And, and, and if you really think this is the whole purpose of what this book is about, and uh, look at... Verse 6, <clears throat> verse 6 says, uh, uh, let me see here. That can't be right. That's way too many verses. <laughs> let's, look at, uh, let's look at verse 35 here. Go to 35. Cast not away, therefore, your confidence, which hath great recompense of reward. For ye have, ye have need of patience, that after ye have done the will of God, ye might receive the promise. For yet a little while, and he that shall come will come and will not tarry. Now the just shall live by faith. But if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. But we are not of them who draw back unto perdition, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. Okay, now he says something similar here at the beginning of the chapter. And I'm not so sure what I was, uh, where I was going here. Uh, where it says there's no more a, uh, oh, I'm sorry. It's right after t verse 25, our text. Okay, verse 26. For if we sin willfully, after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation, which shall devour the adversaries. He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Of how much sorer punishment suppose ye shall he be thought worthy who hath trodden under the foot of the Son of God and hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing, and hath done despite unto the spirit of grace. And so what he's saying here is that the first point, okay, about the about the church or our assembly, okay, the reason why we have to have church attendance. First thing is because church is essential, okay? Church is essential. It's not just like, well, you can go to church if you want to. No, if you don't go to church, you're going to fall away. 
Okay, you're going to stop serving the Lord. You're going to fall away. It's, it's pretty much inevitable. Okay, and so church is essential. Why is it so? Uh, why is it so important that we don't fall away? Well, here's what he said. He said, "Look, if you fall away, there's no more, you know, sacrifice for sins. There's just a fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation." Uh, and so some people read that and they'll think that you're, it's talking about like you could lose your salvation or something like that. But look, he, he makes it really clear here that he's talking to, uh, he's talking to believers. Okay. Look, he even says, uh, look at 29 again of how much sore punishment. Okay. So you had those who, if they broke Moses's law, they were held accountable to that. They were punished for breaking Moses' law. Maybe the punishment was death. Hey, they didn't get any mercy. They were, they were supposed to be put to death. So here's what he's saying. He, he's saying, Of how much sore punishment suppose ye shall he be thought worthy who hath trodden under the foot the Son of God and hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified. Look, this guy's been sanctified. He's been saved, okay? And he's a, he's a believer. And now here's what it's saying. He's counting this an unholy thing. And he's done despite unto the spirit of grace. Uh, so uh, we just, uh, you, you know, uh, this is a passage, like I said, that is often misquoted where people don't understand that this is talking about a saved person. He's, he's sanctified, right? Now, if, Moses, if under Moses' law, if someone broke the law, does it mean they didn't get to go to heaven? No, it doesn't mean that. It just means they were punished by that, okay? And now what he's saying is, now you're not under the law. We realize that as believers. I just preached a message about this uh, yesterday, about not being uh, under the law, but under grace. And I'll explain that here a little bit. But now that we're under grace, and what I mean by under grace is that, well, look back at our, at our verse, verse 29. He says, you have, at the very last part there, it says, and hath done despite unto the spirit of grace. Look, once you're saved, you're saved by grace, right? Once you're saved, you're under grace. And the point of the one of the things I brought out in the message yesterday uh, in Iola was that, you know, when you're under the law, what that means is you're bound by the law. You're under the law. Okay, if you think that you can get to heaven by uh, keeping the law, then you're bound to keep the entire law. And you're, you're bound by that. You're under the law. Hey, okay, when you get to heaven and you stand before God, great white throne judgment, let's see if you're how you did in keeping the entire law. You're under that. You're bound by that. You're under the law. So if we're going to use that, and, I, and that's pretty consistent, you can look up un, being under something in the Bible, and that's pretty consistent. If you're going to say that, well, then what does it mean to be under grace? You're bound by grace. And one of the points I brought up was you couldn't get out from under grace if you wanted to, right? No man can pluck you out of your father's hands. You couldn't get out from grace. You can't just say, you know what? There's an interesting story. Valerie's uh, sister, we were talking about this on the way up here. Uh, Valerie's sister, when she was young, she went through this age uh, where she was very rebellious and she was tired of living in a Christian home, but she knew she was saved. She knew she was saved. And she actually made the statement, now praise the Lord, now she's following the Lord and they're missionaries and she's... Uh, she remembers this and, and looks back on it with, with sorrow. But she said, if I could, she said, I would give my salvation back to the Lord. She was just tired of being that. She's like, if it were possible, I would do that. She's, but she knew in her heart she can't. And I was talking to the lady today whenever we were soul winning, and I said, you know, even if you wanted to, you're just like, you know what? I don't want to believe in Christ anymore. I don't think you could stop believing. <laughs> I don't think you could just say, oh, I don't believe in him anymore. Too bad. You can say that all you want, but inside the Holy Spirit is saying, yes, you do, dummy. You could say, well, I'm not going to follow him anymore. Well, then you're going to be chastened by God, and you're going you're to really regret not following him, but you're still under grace. You know, you, you, you're just, you're under grace, but you're trampling it, and you're making despite of it. You're saying, hey, who cares that I'm under grace and you're living in sin? That's what Romans 6 is all about. And so we don't want to continue living in sin uh, because, look, we're going to be judged according to that in this life. And uh, we're going to be losing some rewards in the life to come if we continue in sin. So it's essential that this is why he left uh, the, 
the work of the church, uh, the commission that Jesus gave, this is why he left it and this is why he set it up that way because that's how you're going to keep from falling back into sin. That's how you're going to keep from walking in the new man. You've got to instead walk in the spirit. That You've got to meet together and you've got to encourage one another and you've got to be... Uh, uh, you got to be uh, uh, following the Lord. Now, I, I do remember this, uh, this guy was telling me, uh, you know, a lot of people will make it seem like if you stop going to church, you know, even today preachers won't say that, that you're not saved if you don't go to church, but what they will say, uh, or if you stop going to church, you'll lose your salvation. They wouldn't say that. No Baptist preacher that I know would say that. Okay, but what they'll say is, if somebody stops going to church, they were never saved to begin with. Have you ever heard that? Like if that person, you know, he stopped going to church. That's just evidence that he, and here's where they get that. He, they get that from, uh, uh, where's this, where's the passage? First John chapter two, you know, you're familiar with it. First John chapter two. And look at verse uh, 19. It says, they went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been, with, uh, been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. So some people make that church membership. Like they were with, they were with us, and then they went out from us. That means they were never saved to begin with. Now, that might sound crazy to you, but a guy was telling me, uh, uh, Brother Mike Schmidt, remember when he came missionary to Brazil, and he came. Uh, and gave, uh, yeah, he preached a message here. And uh, he was telling me on the way up here, he said he actually, whenever he was at Heartland, they went out and uh, he was on a traveling group. They had a singing group and he was on there. And he said they stopped, I don't remember where the church was or who the preacher was, but he said he stopped at a church and they were going to sing for this church. And he said while the ladies went and did something, he said he hung out with the pastor and they went driving around, whatever. They had a uh, a, a big church, you know, like a lot of people were in attendance. And he said, man, how do you go about like keeping all these people coming? And, and uh, just what are some things that you do? He's trying to get some tips from him and everything. And he said, well, here's what I do. This is about Mike Schmidt's testimony. He says, he, this guy told him, he said, here's what I go I do. I take them to first John and I show them that if they stop coming to church, then they were never saved to begin with. <laughs> Can you believe somebody doing that? Can you believe somebody saying, like, if you just stop coming to this church, that means you were never saved. And so all these people are coming to church because they don't want anybody thinking that they weren't saved. If I, I mean, obviously, if you hear a preacher preaching that, don't go to that church okay? because he's preaching a lie. But he said, I couldn't believe that he said that, you know. Some people try to make the Bible say they try to scare you like you have to keep going to church or else you're not, you know, you're not saved or something like that. Not what the Bible's teaching the Bible is just teaching that we must get together if we can expect to keep walking in the Spirit and keep living for the Lord. If we don't get together, we, if we continue uh, you know, not, to, not to assemble together, we're going to fall back into sin and we're going to walk in the flesh. Not losing our salvation, but we're definitely going to feel the uh, discipline and chastening hand of God. So it's essential to our Christian life that we uh, continue to follow the Lord. Look at uh, Romans 6, 1. I mentioned this uh, a little bit about the sermon that I preached yesterday. That we are under grace, okay? This is back to that idea about not being under sin, but under, uh, not being under the law, but being under grace. Uh, by the way, if we're under, if we're under the law, the Bible says that's the equivalent of being under sin. And if we're under sin, the Bible says that's the equivalent of being under the curse. Okay? Because if you think you're going to get to heaven by keeping the law, you're not. You're not going to make it. So you're under the curse. And so praise the Lord that we're under grace. All right, here's what it says. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? And a lot of people, when you try to talk to them about the fact that we're saved uh, by faith, you know, and, and uh, you know, it's by grace. They'll a lot of times take you to this verse and they'll say, wait, 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 you shouldn't continue in sin. You know, like, like if, you, if, you, if you're saved, you're not going to sin anymore. And actually what this verse is saying is that grace would still abound if we continued in sin. Otherwise, why would he have to say, should we continue in sin that grace may abound? 
grace does still abound. Even if you fall back into sin, you know, you're still saved. It's very important to know that. Okay, verse uh, uh, 14, same chapter. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. Okay, again, that under has to do with like a servitude, right? You're being bound to something. Hey, sin no longer has dominion over you. Does that mean you're not going to sin anymore? No, you're still going to sin, but it doesn't, it, 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 it doesn't have any power over you. It doesn't have any authority over you because you're under grace. You're getting to heaven because of what Jesus did, not because you keep the law. And so, uh, so anyway, that's, uh, it's essential to our Christian life, however, that we continue meeting together and going to church. <clears throat> Number two, not only is church essential, church is exclusive. Now, here's what I mean by that. Exclusive. Now, look, the gospel is very inclusive, right? Whosoever will may come. But it is exclusive because Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. It's not like just a, anybody, anybody is just saved, right? That's not what it's saying. It's inclusive, but it's very exclusive, okay? So when you think about what the church is, and again, on the idea was on Wednesday to preach about the, uh, 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 the whether church is public or is private, okay? And let me just say about that real quickly. I believe when you talk about the church, there are three, three different ways in which we can assemble, okay? Number one, I won't spend a lot of time on that, but what's called the general assembly. And, of course, this comes right from Hebrews where it talks about, hey, you are now part of the general assembly. And if you look at what that's saying, it's actually talking about the heavenly assembly. Okay? You're, you're seated in heavenly places, basically, like you we are part, when we're in Christ, we are a part of this community of believers who's going to be in heaven and the new Jerusalem and, you know, all uh, the new city. We're going to be together all eternity. Look, we are part of the church. Now, we don't say that because the universal church doctrine out there, that get, uh, it's very confusing. But in a way, church, uh, Jesus did start his church. I'll build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And that includes everybody who is saved, okay? We don't go around talking about the church age, and we don't say, hey, the church is going to do this, and the church is going to do that. I slip sometimes and say that, but I understand uh, the, we're a local church. We don't believe that, hey, there's this, this ecumenical, like anybody who just says that, they're, uh, uh, says that they're Christians are part of this church. That's a Catholic thing, but we, 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 don't, we, we don't embrace that. However, we do know that everybody, we can go all over, this, all over this world and we can find fellow believers and we can sit down with them and say, hey, that is my brother in Christ. That is my sister in Christ. And we share this, we share this bond. There is a general assembly. Not going to talk about that a whole lot. Then there is also, we understand this, there's the local assembly. The Bible talks about this more than anything else. It says the church of Ephesus, you know, the uh, seven churches of Asia in Revelation, the church of Galatia. Uh, we know that there are individual local churches, meaning what I mean by local church is that they actually meet in a location. They all came here to this location and they meet together. Now that location could change tomorrow, but that church still meets at a location, right? And, uh, and so it's a physical, uh, a visual uh, body that meets together. You can see them. That, that's local church. That's what we mean by that. And this is how God wants, I believe, his churches to, uh, to go on. Now, we might be part of this, this big assembly, this general assembly, but we meet in a, on a local level. Okay, we meet. And so some people will say, well, the church is just open to all. Anybody can come and be part of your assembly. Well, not necessarily. And actually, if you're an American, one of the greatest things this nation was built on separation of church and state. Do you know that? It was built on that fact. Hey, we want religious freedoms. We don't want the government, the state telling us this is how you need to worship. We want to be able to be distinct and separate from them. And thank the Lord, we still have that. Now, some people have tried to infringe upon that at different points in our history. Uh, we are we can never be called a public assembly, right? Nobody could ever say, well, I have access into that because they're a church and I want to go in there. Now, I don't know if Biden's going to try to change that. Hey, you can't refuse service to such and such people, right? But according to our First Amendment, 
that's not the case. And, uh, and, and quite honestly, if you just think about, hey, if we're going to be biblical, and, and look, we ought to obey God rather than man anyway. So if we're going to be biblical, what does the Bible say? Well, there's lots of examples of having to remove somebody from the assembly. Right? 1 Corinthians 5 says if someone's a drunkard, extortioner, idolater, all these people, we're supposed to put them out of the assembly. Somebody's going to come in and cause problems. We have every right, both legally, thank the Lord, but then also biblically, we have every right to say, nope, you're not going to uh, be in this assembly. This is a private meeting. We say, well, what about, what about you know, visitors? Are visitors not allowed to come in? Well, of course they are. Of course they are. We want to welcome visitors in to some extent, right? But even then, it's exclusive because, you know, you can come in, but we practice a, a membership, okay? So somebody could come in. They're not a member. They're just, they're visiting our assembly, okay? Uh, I don't know if I wrote it down. James, uh, let me see here. James chapter, uh, man, I can't remember. Okay, two. James chapter two. My brethren, have not the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory with respect of persons. For if there come unto your assembly a man with, gold ring, with a gold ring in goodly apparel, and there come in also a, a poor man in vile raiment, and ye have respect to him that weareth the gay clothing. Hey, I'm, uh, we need to take the word gay. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> don't, don't say someone has gay clothing on these days. Okay, okay. Uh, <laughs> so if you say to the man with a gay clothing, that just means goodly apparel, like fancy clothes and all that stuff. That gay doesn't mean what it means today. And, uh, and they, they say unto him, sit thou here in a good place. Or say to the poor, stand thou there, or sit here under my footstool. Are ye not then partial in yourselves, and are become judges of evil thoughts? Okay. So what I want to focus on the point that he said there, uh, a man, may, these people are coming into your assembly. Now how'd they get there? I don't know. Maybe they were a family member and it's visiting from out of town, and they said, hey, why don't you come with me to uh, the assembly? Maybe somebody had just invited them. Hey, you're a believer now. Why don't you come to our assembly? Maybe, who knows? Maybe they just saw that the people were meeting. Uh, you know, there's uh, one place in Acts where it says, uh, a couple places where it says that they shut the door because they feared the Jews, which implies that normally they would just have the doors open. <laughs> Maybe somebody would come and hear people singing and say, hey, I want to go in and see what's going on. Hey, look, we're not so private, so ex exclusive that nobody knows where we are. We don't have a sign out there. Well, we don't have a sign out there, but I'm not against signs. <laughs> we're not so exclusive that it's like, no, you're not welcome in here unless you know the secret handshake or the password or something like that. No, but we are exclusive in that we're only going to allow people, uh, you know, that, uh, that have showed themselves to be number one. Right? If they refuse to get saved, they're not really, there's no reason for them to be part of the church. They're not part of the church. Okay, if they're not going to obey certain rules and commandments, uh, not, we're not making commandments, you know, uh, for salvation or anything like that. But if there's certain rules and they're not willing to follow those rules, hey, they're not welcome in the assembly. The, 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 the local church is actually uh, exclusive, okay? And then we have this throughout the Bible uh, where we have kind of small group assemblies, or sometimes they would meet in people's houses, right? And, and they would say, uh, uh, greet so-and-so and the church that is in their house, you know? I think, here's what I think happened. I'll probably explain this to you before, but I think, for instance, the church of Ephesus, okay? I believe this was a big congregation. I believe Ephesus was a pretty big place. And if you read that, there were several elders in Ephesus, which was sometimes they would meet together. and Paul would have a special meeting with the elders in Ephesus. But I think that what happened was you had these small groups spread all around, and they would only come occasionally to actually meet together in a, in a bigger assembly of people. But you had all these, like, smaller groups. This is kind of the way I think it was going on. And so today, you know, the way that is carried out, uh, some people started this kind of small group uh, uh, trend or whatever. A lot of uh, progressive type churches would do these small groups where you'll just meet at so-and-so's house and have some coffee and have a little Bible study or whatever. Well, that's not really what I'm talking about, but we do see in churches where they started doing uh, Sunday school classes and, 
and different things like that. I think, uh, I think actually that's kind of what saved in the early churches, you know, uh, early Baptist churches that got so big, what we would think about more like mega churches nowadays, and they got so big and you think, well, that's actually pretty dangerous. When you have that many people together, you, got, you know that some people got in there who have not been vetted. <laughs> some people got in there maybe child molester. Maybe, uh, you know, they teach wrong doctrine. You know, maybe they're going to stir up trouble and everything. How do you keep that big of a group of people organized? I think what saved a lot of those big independent Baptist churches of the early years, uh, 40s, 50s, whatever, even before that, I guess, in the eight, late 1800s. But what saved a lot of those, I think, is this, this mentality of dividing up into the Sunday schools. Now, we don't do that here. We, we just, everybody meets together, okay? But I think what they did is they started dividing up into this groups. You got this college age class, and maybe that was even divided up in a couple uh, things. You got different age groups of the kids. Uh, you got a married couples. Maybe you got a uh, more, uh, more uh, mature married couple group. Maybe you got career minded people, college and career. And they began, they had all these like smaller groups that would meet together. And that's how they would keep their attendance. That's how they would practice even church discipline. You know, they'd be like, hey, that guy, you know, he's in your Sunday school group, isn't he? And so you had all these like different people that were heads over these different classes. I believe that's what kept some of those churches staying organized, even though they had such a big group of people. Now, when you all meet together, uh, like we do here, uh, it's a little bit harder to do that. Uh, and so I think, I personally, here's what I think, we need to have more churches. That's what I think the answer is, more independent churches. We don't have to have a group. I'm not saying it's wrong, but we don't have to have a group of a thousand people meeting together. If we got a thousand people in one building, we probably could have four or five churches really easily that are a little bit closer to where these people live. <laughs> you know, we don't have to have that big of a, of a people. So anyway, I'm just saying that it's uh, it, there's small groups, there's a local church. But the idea is that church is exclusive, okay? It is more of a private nature. Obviously, we want to welcome people in if they're going to be a part of us, if they're going to get saved. If they're going to... Now, if someone walks in and they're not saved, we're going to give them the gospel. We're going to hope they get saved. If they walk in and they're just and they're dealing with all these sins in their lives or whatever, we're going to try to get them on the right path and get them out of that. But there comes a time where you're like, nope, you're not welcome in this uh, assembly, you know, because it's a private assembly, it's exclusive. So first of all, the church is a, a, essential. Secondly, the church is exclusive. And now uh, the third point I want to make is the church is exhortative. Exhortative, okay? What's that mean? We are exhort one another. We come here for exhortation. Now, the word means, uh, uh, I didn't realize this before. I'd never heard this word. Have you guys ever word, heard the word hortation, right? It means the same thing. They just put X in front of it, but exhortation. Hortation has to do with um, encouraging somebody, okay? Uh, uh, now, here's what a lot of people say, exhort, exhort one another. And they'll think, hey, just be an encouragement, be uplifting, like say nice things, be positive only or whatever. Well, that's not what exhortation really means. Okay, now it is a little bit more of a positive nature, you know, so you say, uh, uh, what are we supposed to do? The Bible says in uh, 2 Timothy 4, 2, it says, what is the preacher supposed to do? He's supposed to rebu reprove, rebuke, and exhort, right? Now that exhort is a little bit more of a positive nature. It's saying what you're doing is you're, you're encouraging, you're, you're challenging them to... Uh, you're, uh, 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 to, to, to do something, right? You're encourage. So encourage, even though that word is, is, is misused a lot of times. What do you do? It means give them courage. Give them courage to do what they're supposed to do. So you're emboldening them. You're helping them to do. In fact, every time the Bible uses the word exhort, it's not just like, oh, speak positive only. No, it's just encouraging them to do what's right. Maybe they've been doing what's wrong. Now you reproved them or you rebuked them. And now you're encouraging them to do what's right. You're exhorting them. And so, uh, and so the Bible has a lot to say about uh, exhortation. Uh, look at, oh, good grief, I don't remember where it is. I don't remember where it is, but in the text here, uh, it tells us uh, that we're supposed to exhort one another. Uh, well, I know in our text, is, uh, what am I talking about? 25, right in our, uh, our main text that we read. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as a manner of some is, but, what's it say? Exhorting one another. 
and so much more as you see the day approaching. So what I was saying was, hey, it's essential because of the fact that if we don't meet together, we're going to fall away. So how do we stop from falling away? Well, we need to be exhorted to do right. We need to be exhorted not to fall away. Now, so what do you do if you go to a church and the church uh, is just accepting you the way you are? It's not telling you to change your life. It's not preaching against your sins or whatever. Well, then it's just probably just as good for you as if you didn't go to church, right? Because a church is supposed to be exhortative. You're supposed to go there and you're supposed to walk away saying, man, I need to live right. I need to do right. I need to get back into serving God. I need to be back into reading my Bible. I just talked to somebody today who hadn't been to church in a while. And I said, how are things going? And they talked about some things. And I said, other than that, how are things going? Not very good. I didn't think so. You know why I didn't think so? Because you hadn't been to church in a while. Yeah, I just lost my zeal, and I need to get back, and I need to do this, and, and I just don't know what happened. I don't even feel like reading my Bible anymore. You know, the next step is going to, I've seen this happen to people. The next step there is like, I just don't even know if I was ever actually saved. Right? <laughs> Some people actually do that. It doesn't mean they're not saved because they're entertaining that thought. What it means is they've been so long without hearing from God and feeling the, the, the push of God in their life that they begin thinking, maybe I'm not even saved calling all these preachers and saying, hey, you think it's possible I'm not saved? You think it's possible I'm a reprobate? I'm like, when's the last time you went to church? Well, I ain't gone to church in a long time. I just don't feel like, you know, I just don't feel it. And that's why I think I might be a reprobate. I don't feel it. You got to be in church. You got to be exhorted. <laughs> you got to be around people who are going to exhort you. Now, the Bible says uh, that we're supposed to exhort one another, even in our psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, right? In Colossians chapter 3, it says that we're supposed to, uh, uh, it doesn't say exhort, but it says, uh, help me. It's another word that it uses. huh? Admonish one another. Psalms, hymns, spiritual songs. Same idea. Okay, uh, even our singing, even our fellowship time, it should be strengthening each other and helping each other to leave this place thinking, hey, you know what? I'm glad I went to church. Now I want to live for the Lord. So you go back into your home place, you go back to your workforce, you go back to your family situation, whatever it is, and you say, I'm going to do better this week. I'm going to try better. Now you might mess up again. Come back next service because <laughs> right? we're all going to, we need each other on a regular basis. That's why we uh, forsake not the assembling of ourselves together. It's ex ex exhortative. And then the last point is that it is enduring, Okay. The church is enduring. What do you mean? It, uh, if it's a church, it'll last forever. It'll never cease to be a, a church. No, there's a lot of churches that are shut down after a certain amount of time. A lot of chur uh, uh, churches might shut down just because people stop going. They don't have attendance anymore. They just have to fold. Maybe a church will shut down because uh, they go into all manners of, of false doctrines and all that stuff. But what Jesus said in the Revelation is he said, hey, I will, I will put the candle out. Right. And so there's this idea of there comes a time when a church's candle is put out. But guess what? The church still goes on. The, ch the work of the church still goes on. Look, if this church goes into apostasy, if I'm teaching all kind of false, maybe I'm teaching damnable heresy. I don't think it's ever going to happen, but I'm just saying if I'm teaching damnable heresy and you guys say, you know what? We need to leave. The work of the church is still going on. You're just going to meet somewhere else. Maybe you even have to meet with a different group of people. You're still a church, the church of God. It still goes on. Okay, uh, we in our, have you guys ever read our church covenant? I say our church covenant. Since uh, 18, I think it's 45 or 49 or something like that. Uh, and if you remember when I preached on uh, alcohol and I talked about the, uh, uh, the temperance movement? And back in the 18th, think about the Old West and the saloons and all that. And then you had these ladies that were like starting these groups trying to ban alcohol and, and these religious organizations. Next thing you know, they're preaching hard against it. And then there was the uh, uh, prohibition and all that kind of stuff. Same time period, okay? So in, in, around that time, a group of Baptists came up with this church covenant. And I've got a copy of it back on the table if you want to read it. This is pretty much almost probably every Baptist church you've been to uh, probably has that church covenant, okay? And it's not like a biblical thing. It's just saying, hey, here's some things that as a church we're going to covenant together. This is what we are going to stand for. 
And the reason I mentioned the prohibition thing and the temperance movement is because in there it says we will stay away from drinking or selling or any uh, alcoholic beverages. So when you read that, you got to remember that time period that this was that that was written. And uh, and in the end of all those things, hey, we're going to do our family devotions. We're going to uh, we're not going to you know do all these particular sins and all this kind of stuff. At the very end, it says this: We moreover engage that when we remove from this place. We will as soon as possible unite with some other church where we can carry out the spirit of this covenant and the principles of God's word. So it's saying, hey, even if this church fails to exist, I'm still going to go align myself with another group of people and, 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 uh, and follow the Lord. Because at the end of the day, Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And so the church is enduring. Okay, It will last forever. We already know because we read in Revelation. Right, that the uh, that there is a church there. All right, so the church is essential. The church is exclusive. The church is exhortative, and the church is enduring. Let's pray, Father. Thank you for your church, and thank you, Lord, for this local assembly. And uh, I pray that you will help us, Lord, to um, continue to do the work you called us to, and. Uh, and follow your leadership and exhort one another. Help us to reach those who are not coming for one reason or another, or, or uh, particularly those who might have just kind of gotten out of the habit and fallen away and maybe fallen into sin or whatever. Lord, help us do what we can to stop that those people from uh, falling away to the point where their lives are going to be destroyed and... Uh, and because we know that you will judge your people and you will chasten them uh, when they fall away. So help us, Lord, to uh, pray for one another, encourage one another, and help us meet together as often as we can, Lord. Uh, I pray that you will, um, you will help this body here to grow, add laborers, and, and uh, see a lot of souls saved. But Father, whether we're, we remain forever a small congregation or whether we grow or whether we start more churches um, as a result of the work you called us to, Lord, we pray you be glorified and that your church will endure. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.